Hello, everyone. Good evening. I know you've come to hear Neil. I'll be as rapid as I can. My name is Chris Bryce. Uh, I was a sometime member of the Just Share Steering Group and possibly one of its founder members. I'm now vicar of a church in Kentish Town in the middle of a very large, very deprived housing estate where we have about 70 names on our war memorial and where some of our church members have been interested in the anniversary of the First World War, including wanting a service and to plant poppies and various other things. But you've come to hear Neil, uh, who very roughly was brought up uh, somewhere in Tunbridge Wells. He educated at Cambridge and London. He works as a freelance lecturer, editor, writer, excavator, and occasional broadcaster. He lectures widely in archaeology, ancient history, classical civilization, modern history, and current affairs. He's editor of a popular magazine, Military History Monthly. He has the author of numerous academic papers and seven books, his latest being a Marxist history of the world from Neanderthals to neoliberals. And he's director of several archaeological projects from Sedgeford in Norfolk all the way to a great Arab revolt project in southern Jordan associated with Lawrence of Arabia's campaigns. He also appears on TV, including Channel 4's Time Team, BBC 2's Time Watch, Channel 5's Revealed series, and he's a leading consultant and contributor for Sky Atlantic's The British Series. He's the man you've come to hear. I'm going to hand over to him, and I, Neil, welcome. Very much look forward to hearing you and to having questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is the volume okay? Is it comfortable? Okay. What I, I mean, I understand that the, the sort of theme very much of these talks is ethics. So I'm going to say something about ethics right at the very beginning before talking specifically about the First World War. And I would say this about ethics. They do not exist in abstraction. They do not float around in the ether. They are socially embedded. There are no absolutes when we think about um, ethics. So it is not possible to say War is always wrong as a kind of ethical abstraction. There are certain circumstances when it is not wrong. And those circumstances are when there is a greater violence that will be done if people do not defend themselves. And I'm going to give you one or two examples of what I mean by that. I'm going to give you the example of the American Civil War. And I would say about that conflict, it was a just war a just and necessary war because of the violence of human slavery. And it was the war that abolished slavery on the North American continent. And I think it would have been wrong for ethically upright, moral people to oppose the Union war effort between 1861 and 1865. I'll give you another example. The Irish were entitled to fight to get the British Empire out of their country between 1919 and 1921. They were entitled to fight in response to the violence of the British Army, the British created police force, and the Black and Tans. That was a just war. It was a war against a greater violence represented by imperialism. I'll give you a third example. The Vietnamese were entitled to fight to get the Japanese out of their country, and then the French out of their country, and then the Americans out of their country. They were entitled to fight against the, against the violence of imperialism. Ethics are embedded in social context, and you can't, you can't work out what is right and what is wrong in terms of a generalized set of universals. The First World War was not like those conflicts. And I'm going to try and explain why I think that is. And it's a, it's, a, it's a very topical argument because right now, the running is being made in this discussion by right-wing revisionists, by those who argue that the First World War was necessary, it was just a necessary sacrifice. That's the dominant paradigm that's coming from mainstream 
political historians, military historians, from academics, study the First World War, and it's being reflected in what the politicians um, are saying. And I think the reason for that is very simply because the politicians have been waging a war on terror, a self-declared war on terror since 2001. And they are seeking to rehabilitate the idea of Western imperial uh, military power being projected into other parts of the world as if, for, as if a force for good. So there's a kind of contemporary context for this attempt to revise the way in which we think about the First World War. Because there's a very different way in which people talked about it in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. So let me say this about it. It was not a war against German aggression. The war between 1914 and 1918 was not a war against German aggression. The British and the French were just as aggressive in defense of empire as the Germans. It was the British who had engaged in a naval arms race and outbuilt Germany in the years leading up to the First World War. It was the British who had formed an alliance with the French and the Russians and encircled Germany. It was the British who controlled the biggest overseas empire in the world. The British were militarizing, they were building alliances, and they were doing that in order to defend the fact that they had the biggest empire in the world. It's not about German aggression versus the peace-loving Western powers. Nor is it about German autocracy, a war against Prussianism, a war against a particular style of government. And that's another part of the argument that has been uh, put, that was put at the time, actually, and is put again now. Half the working class, half of working class men in Britain in 1914 didn't have the vote. It wasn't just women who didn't have the vote. Half the working class, working class men didn't have the vote either. 40% 40, 40, 40 of men across the, across the whole country. Everybody had the vote in Germany. Germany had universal suffrage. So the idea that this is a uniquely, a specially autocratic kind of uh, system um, is false. And of course, the British and the French were in alliance with the Tsar, the most autocratic government in the whole um, of Europe. And if it was about German autocracy, let me tell you this. There was no democracy under the British Empire in Ireland, Egypt, or India. The idea that this was somehow a war for democracy against a more autocratic system of government is clearly false. And there's a third argument they put. They put the argument that it was a response to German atrocities. The Germans were particularly nasty. They killed 6,000 Belgian civilians. They did. They were nasty. And so were the Belgians who were the allies of the British and the French, who were chopping off the hands of children in the Congo because they did not meet their rubber quotas on the plantations. And so were the Serbians, nasty. And they were allies of the British and the French, so we don't talk about those atrocities, but they were ethnically cleansing Muslims from the territories that they had taken in the Second Balkan War, in the First, Balkan, first and Second Balkan Wars, 1912, 1913. And so was the Tsar, in alliance with the British and the French, presiding over a nasty regime guilty of atrocities. When the Tsar's army went into Galicia, they murdered large numbers of Jews. They carried out anti-Semitic pogroms. So it's not a war against atrocities. It's a war being, committed, it's a war being waged by different imperial powers, all of whom are guilty of atrocities. What's it really about? It's an imperialist war. It's a war between different groups of bankers and industrialists and arms manufacturers, organized into competing nation states, organized into competing empires. And some of them are defending empires that already exist, like the British and the French, and others are trying to move into a world that is already very crowded with other imperial powers, like the Germans, which makes it easy 
to portray the Germans, um, the Johnny Come Latelys, to imperial adventure, if you like, um, as the aggressors. It's a war to redivide the world in the interests of one group of bankers and industrialists and arms manufacturers as opposed to another group. And that's what happens. At the end of the war, the British and the French, as the victors, help themselves to the whole of the Middle East. They also wanted to help themselves to Turkey, let me tell you. They had a plan to partition Turkey, but they were prevented from doing that because the Turks organized themselves to kick the imperial powers out. They fought a war. Uh, against the Greeks primarily, who were particularly determined to cash in their chips, having been on the side of the victors. This was an imperial war. And the way you experience the war in Africa, let's take Africa, uh, somewhere between 100,000 and 250,000 black porters were worked to death in a white man's war. How did you experience the First World War if you were an African? The policemen change their uniforms. So instead of German uniformed policemen, you had, if you were living in, say, Tanzania, British uniformed policemen from 1919 um, onwards. And what happened to most people um, who'd fought in that war, who survived it when they went home? Those who weren't bankers, those who weren't industrialists, those who weren't imperialists, those who weren't benefiting from the redivision of the world, they went back to the unemployment and the slums and the poverty. And it didn't make much difference whether you were a British soldier returning home or a German soldier returning home. You went back to the same social conditions, having fought a rich man's war. But it wasn't a rich man's war like previous rich men's wars. This time, it was industrialized. This time, entire industrial economies were harnessed, were mobilized behind the fighting forces. So instead of armies of tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands, this time it was armies of millions. And instead of the sort of firepower you had at the Battle of Waterloo or the Battle of Gettysburg, there was firepower without precedent because of the sophistication of the weaponry because of the mass production of guns and munitions. Phenomenal, unprecedented firepower, where the great powers, the imperial powers, turned the ingenuity, the productivity, the creativity of humanity, which has the capacity to transform human experience and solve human problems, transformed that into a vast, mechanism of destruction, a vast mechanism for the destruction of human life. That's why people opposed it. They opposed it before it started, they opposed it while it was happening, and they opposed it at the end and brought it to an end. In Britain, there were a number of different types of people, a number of different groups of people who opposed it. Despite the wave of jingo, and propaganda and intimidation when the war broke out. Despite that, there were people who stood their ground. There's an old British tradition that really goes back to the 16th century, the Reformation, the 17th century, the Revolution, a tradition of asserting the rights of the freeborn Englishman and woman, a tradition of nonconformity, of radicalism, a tradition of saying we have a right to say no, a tradition of pacifism. That tradition was still alive uh, in 1914. It takes the form of conscientious objection. And in the course of the First World War, there were something like 20,000 conscientious objectors in Britain, 6,000 of whom were imprisoned for their resistance to the war, some of them with religious motivation, particularly Quakers, some of them philosophical or political motivation. The most famous of those is Bertrand Russell, who was put in prison at the time of the First World War. That's one strand of opposition. A second strand of opposition were the socialists. 
uh, people like Keir Hardy, the leader of the Labour Party, Ramsay MacDonald, later a leader of the Labour Party. Some of the existing socialist movement said, this is an imperialist war and we will not support it. A third strand were the suffragettes. The suffragette movement was split down the middle. By the way, if you're a suffragette fighting for the right to vote, the enemy was not the German Kaiser. The enemy was the liberal government that would not grant the right to vote. The suffragette movement split um, with the cons more conservative members of the movement, Emmeline Pankhurst and Christabel Pankhurst, encouraging men to volunteer to go and fight. The radical wing, led by Sylvia uh, Pankhurst, breaking with um, the rest of the suffragette movement in order to oppose the war. A fourth strand were the militant trade unionists, the shop stewards, the syndicalists. And by the way, if you were a miner in South Wales, or you were an engineering worker in the Glasgow shipyards, the enemy was not the German Kaiser. It was the mine boss in South Wales, or the shipyard owner in Glasgow. And militant shop stewards understood that the real enemy was at home. And there was a strand of opposition to the war there. And the fifth strand in Britain were the Irish nationalists. Ireland was divided, of course, by the war. Conservative nationalists said we should support the British war effort. Radical nationalists said that we should not. It's their war. The real enemy is um, the British Empire. Irish nationalists opposed, uh, um, opposed um, the war, both in Ireland and in Britain. Despite this, these groups are a relatively small minority in 1914. And it's the same across Europe, across the whole of Europe. There's a wave of jingo and euphoria about the war when it first breaks out. The people who refused to succumb, the people who said, this is a rich man's war. This is a war for power and profit. This is a war for empire. The people who had the courage to stand on that ground acted as a rallying point. And their role was crucial because as the reality of the war unfolded, as it became clear that this was relentless, endless, industrialized slaughter, growing numbers of people came out against the war at home and in the fighting fronts. It changes as we move through time. There's growing disenchantment, growing resistance, and that eventually takes the form of mutinies, of strikes, of demonstrations, which reach a point in 1917 where the war is shut down on the Eastern Front and then in 1918, where the war is shut down on the Western Front. Two events in the First World War. On the Eastern Front, it is the Russian Revolution. That begins in February 1917, reaches its culmination in October 1917. The war is ended by the workers, the soldiers, the sailors, and the peasants of Russia who refuse to continue fighting. In that summer of 1917, on the Eastern Front, it is not ended by the German generals, it's not ended by the Russian generals, it is ended because hundreds of thousands of peasant conscript soldiers climb out of the trenches and head for home and they shoot officers who try and stop them. That's how it's ended. And in Germany, at the time of the armistice, I'll tell you why. The German generals agreed the armistice when they did in, on the 11th of November, 1918. It's because the revolution had already started at home. It's because they had ordered the sailors of the high seas fleet to, to sea in a last ditch attempt to take on the Royal Navy and turn the tide of the war. And the sailors had refused late October. 
1918. And having refused, they took control of their ships. And then they spread the mutiny into the docks at Kiel. And from there, the contagion of mutiny and strikes and resistance spread across the whole of Germany. And when they signed the armistice on the 11th of November, 1918, there were already hundreds of thousands of people on the streets of Berlin, waving red flags. And the reason why the German generals agreed to the armistice when they did was because they could see that if they did not sign the armistice, the German army would join the revolution and collapse in exactly the same way as the Tsar's army had done the previous year on the Eastern Front. So the First World War was ended by a great explosion of revolt from below against war. The greatest anti-war movement in human history unfolded between 1917 and 1918. A great wave of revulsion against the carnage and against the system responsible for the carnage. So it doesn't, wasn't just the war which was in question in 1917, 1918, it was actually the survival of the system that had given rise to that war. And I'm going to end, it, end with this. It's one of my favorite anecdotes. Because people sometimes think it wasn't like that in Britain. They have a revolution in Russia, they have a revolution in Germany, but what's it like in Britain? Britain was close to revolution in 1919. And um, just to give you a flavor, of that radical mood that there was around. On the anniversary of the armistice, they, they decided to have a celebratory dinner. So this is November 1919 in Luton. Luton is a, an old industrial town. Um, and uh, they decided they'd have this, this celebratory dinner, this victory dinner, if you like, um, in the town hall. And they invited all of the great and the good, all the people who'd profited from the war. And uh, they didn't invite the ex-servicemen. So the ex-servicemen marched through the town, and they surrounded Luton Town Hall. And then they went inside the town hall to where the banquet had been laid out, and they threw everything they could get their hands on out of the windows. And then they returned to their position, their stations outside the town hall, and they set it on fire. And they stood there so that the fire engines couldn't get to the blaze, singing, we'll keep the home fires burning. And that gives you an idea of the mood across Europe that brought that war to an end. That was a war for the rich, for profit, for power, and for empire and a war which ordinary working people had, should have had no part in. There you go. Time for questions and uh, comments and disagreements. I hope disagreements. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely a wonderful tour de force. Thank you. Uh, and a, an enormous amount to think about and really, really helpful to be reminded of the connection of books like King Leopold's Ghost, which, as Neil will know, sets out the atrocities of the Belgians in the Congo with the picture of poor defenseless Belgium and that kind of paradoxical counterpointing of things that I found particularly powerful. Um, so I think we need to go straight into questions. As I understand from my studying my history, the First World War, by design, was on the continent, was it not waiting to happen? You had the Germans and Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Germans would have come to their aid, versus the, the triple entente. And I'm further led to understand that Great Britain came into the war to preserve Little Belgium's neutrality in a treaty dating back to Henry VIII's time. Thank you. We'll take a few more comments and questions. Yep, over here, sir. Um, very intriguing speech. I'm, I'm not a military historian. I have studied a bit of history. I think the notion that it was an imperial war 
would not be disagreed by even conservative historians, Lawrence James and his history of the British Empire and his most recent book about Churchill and the Empire describes it as an imperial war. Um, people like Hugh Strawn, who've written extensively on the First World War, have a, a much better take on it than traditional narratives perhaps do. But I think that, in my view, as I see it, the imperialness of it is outside of Europe, not inside of Europe. It's to conquer territory overseas in some of the ways to which you alluded and the lack of room for Germany to do so. I think that the Prussian autocracy argument does have quite a bit of weight. Universal suffrage doesn't necessarily equate with um, a universal ability to influence politics. It was basically an authoritarian system, whatever the flaws in our, in our own. But I think that the key argument doesn't necessarily make it a just war per se, is that Britain's hesitation in going to war initially was because it didn't really want to be involved in the continental war. Britain seldom does, except to restore the balance of power. That's the main reason Britain goes to war on the continent, as opposed to with powers sometimes overseas in an imperial context as well, but actually intervening on the continent only in alliances to, to maintain the balance of power. And what went through the British mind at the time was, if the Germans succeeded in conquering not just Belgium, we didn't go to war to defend Belgium any more than we went to war to defend Poland in the Second World War. It was about the balance of power and the protection of the whole okay. country interest. But so to come to the point is that if Germany had succeeded in occupying France, then Britain's fear, understandably, was that the Germans would be on the Channel Coast, they would have their navy on the Channel Coast. Okay. And it, whether it was an imperial reason or not, it yep. was defense okay. of the homeland ultimately. Thank you very much. One final comment. So that's about balance of power and uh, George, you've got a question. Yeah. Um, I read um, Max Hastings' book, 1914, which is um, a fairly substantial book, and maybe one of the right-wing revisionists' uh, works to which you alluded at, at the beginning. And what slightly surprised me about um, uh, his account, um, but it seemed to be authoritatively expressed, um, was that even up to the last few days before war, the British government was keen to avoid it, and many in the cabinet were unpersuaded. And I think, I think it was Haldane who resigned, if I'm right, or somebody resigned. A couple of two resigned, Because, yeah. and, and indeed, had, had the Germans gone round Belgium, we might not have signed up to war, or at least not at that moment. That's what Hastings seemed to maintain. Um, but the commitment to Belgium was based on on um, the treaty at the foundation of Belgium, which I think is something like 1830 or a bit later on. I can't okay. quite remember, 1834 well, thank perhaps. Thank you, George. I mean, if I may, Neil, you'll do better than I do, but basically a war waiting to happen, uh, sort of current understanding, poor little Belgium needed to be, you know, defended, which is a very, you know, sound and good perspective. Secondly, that, all the, that the imperial war idea is a little bit dodgy because maybe the imperialism was outside Europe and some of the sort of uh, Trump cards that Neil delivered about universal suffrage, etc., not quite as Trumpish as they appear when they're examined because maybe Germany wasn't all it was cut up to be at the time. Uh, balance of power argument. Um, what do you do if Germany practically, pragmatically, for all the theory and the sort of idealism, what do you do if Germany ends up on the Channel Coast uh, and we do nothing, and we just lie down and say, do what you like in Europe, you know, and we'll pick up the pieces afterwards. Uh, and thirdly, that the British government actually was quite keen to avoid the war. So the idea that it was actually a sort of war by the people in power, whether be they politicians or bankers, that we tried to avoid war right up to the end, and may not even have fought, certainly not at the time that we did, Neil. Okay, there's lots there. Um, le let, me, let me do, um, let me approach some of these points um, uh, in, a, in, in a generalized way. If you want to understand history, you need to think in terms of a series of frames. And you can, you can focus on a, a very small frame. And the very small frame might be Belgium, the question of Belgium. What do we do about the German invasion of Belgium? And to understand why Belgium matters, you have to look at a slightly bigger frame. And the bigger frame is to do with the balance of power in Europe, which has been referred to. But to understand why the balance of power in Europe matters, you have to look at a bigger frame. 
And the bigger frame is that these powers are competing with each other for empire. And if you want to understand why they're competing with each other for empire, you have to create a bigger frame. And that is the competition for markets, for raw materials, for opportunities to make profit between the banks and the corporations that are represented by these nation states. Imperialism is the big frame. You need all of those frames, otherwise you don't have context. You cannot orient yourself in the historical process unless you see the whole. The great German philosopher Hegel said, the truth is the whole. Any bit of historical understanding, any attempt to understand a particular historical event requires you to understand the whole. It requires you to understand how the detail that you are focused on at this moment in time is part of something much, much bigger. Why does Belgium matter? Belgium matters because the British have always feared a situation where one power dominates Europe and in particular controls the channel ports because that threatens the security of Britain's control over the seaways and control over the routes to empire. What about the people of Germany as dominated? Do, does Britain care about the fact that France might be enslaved or that Belgium might be enslaved? I mean, does that not matter? Just concerned about the empire? To, to which the answer, the answer is, um, no, the British don't care at all because they have, they have the Irish and they have the Egyptians and they have the Indians and they have countless other people enslaved. The, the well, enslaved, not quite enslaved. They weren't in chains. No, all right, they're not in chains, but then the, the, the Germans are not going to put the French in chains either. Uh, either. Um, if, you're, if you're arguing that statesmen, like the statesmen who made the decision in, 19, in August 1914 to go to war, do it out of humanitarian motives... So they have no good motives at all? None. So the question is, do they have any good motives? The answer is no, they don't. The bankers and the industrialists and the arms manufacturers are interested in profit. British statesmen are interested in protecting the seaways, protecting British colonies. There's no interest in the well-being of ordinary working people in Europe or in, or in Britain. What is the evidence that there is? I think the evidence is that, uh, that, that, that you know, that, 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 that We've done a lot about sanitation, about clean air, about hospitals, about a whole variety of, okay, very modest humanitarian activities. But actually, all I'm, I mean, I'll stop if other people can talk, but, but to label one group of people as entirely corrupt with not one iota of altruism, I just find slightly baffling. But I'll stop there, but you carry on. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering how you want me to respond to that. I mean, you see, what the British Liberal government is responsible for in 1914 is the control of the largest empire in the world at the time, the suppression of the suffragette movement, the suppression of the Irish national movement, the suppression of one industrial dispute after another driven by the poverty of the, of the working class, and plunges Britain into an industrial, a four-year industrialized slaughter, which results in the death of 15 million people. Now, I just do not see the moral virtue in the behavior of the British Liberal government in 1914. I see moral virtue elsewhere. I see moral virtue in the resistance of Irish people to their oppression. I see moral virtue in ordinary working people organizing themselves and striking against poverty wages. I see virtue in ordinary Egyptian people and Indian people fighting for their independence. I see virtue in the Russian revolutionaries who bring the First World War to an end. I see virtue in the German revolutionaries who bring the First World War to an end. I do not see any virtue whatsoever okay. in any of the rulers who are responsible for this terrible war. Okay. Shall we have other questions now from the floor? I'm not going to say any more. I just wanted to perk things up a bit and, you know, give you courage to come back at him. Let's have some questions, yes. What I've understood, and it's really been very helpful, is that even though there might be 
uh, justification in the small picture, which is, you know, someone going into a territory where, which we have promised uh, to sort of protect. And therefore, we might be obliged by some treaty to move in. And so there are all sorts of circumstances. So uh, it just might be that it's something, like in Afghanistan, you know, the argument is we provide some schools for the women or, or for the children, you know, that sort of argument. But the bigger picture seems to be that uh, it's, it's a war that is fought in the long-term interests of defending empires uh, from encroachment by other competitors. Uh, that, I mean, that's what you're saying. Yes. So, um, therefore, there may be rights and wrongs in the immediate um, situations, but the larger situation is that millions of people lose their lives in, the, uh, in an objective, in pursuing an objective which is not in their interest. Yes. Yeah. And if that's the case, then today we stand in a moral situation where we are aggrandizing, um, you know, what happened. And also, we are almost victimizing the victims again because what we are saying is all those people who gave their lives gave it as a sacrifice, which implies that they had a choice. You know, it, people sacrifice their lives when they have a choice. But if millions of people were simply drafted in and kept in their positions regardless, they'd had no choice, then they're not so much sacrificing their lives as they're losing it whether they want it or not. Okay, thank you very much. Let's have another comment from the floor. Yes, sir. Um, I, I read a book about 1914 and the different nationalities involved. And I think, um, it, I can't remember the author's name, but it was, um, he came out with the point that Britain was the least prepared because it had the Irish problem. And that was a major factor which had weakened. Britain was the least prepared. Prepared. Yeah. Or, or you know, it's the wrong word, prepared, able to meet any aggression. Thank you. Comments on that. Final comment at the back there. Yep. Glasses. Thank you. Thank you. Two short questions, please. Why did the Americans take so long to join this orgy of plunder? Second question, what lessons would you like us to learn from this view about, from the speaker's view, about current political decision making? Thank you. So should we begin with those two questions about why did the USA take so long to join this orgy of slaughter and what lessons is there for us today? Okay, let's, uh, let's deal with America first. I, I think what is happening in America is that American opinion is uh, shifting. And there's an argument going on inside American society, and there's an argument going on at the top about whether America has interests in Europe and the wider world, as opposed to America being restricted to having interests which are essentially uh, within, within the, American, well, the two American continents, North America and South America. That's an argument which is happening inside America at the time. And it's not until 1917 that the argument is won, that actually America has an imperial mission, a global, a global mission. I think that's the, that's the answer to that, the basic answer to that question. The second question, what lessons would you like us to learn from this speaker's view about current political decision making? Well, okay, well look, I, I, maybe, maybe the best way to answer that is, the, is, is for me to suggest that we deconstruct one of the categories that's being, that's being deployed. You see, I, I don't accept that there is a meaningful category, which is Britain. That, that Britain is an entity. Britain does this. Britain does something else. Is it in Britain's in, in, interest? Is Britain acting correctly? Because Britain is not an entity. Britain is a deeply class-divided society now as it was in the past. And that means what's in the interests of some people in Britain is not in the interests of other people in Britain. So if it's a matter of political decision making, I would say that the political decision making in Britain today, as in 1914, should not be made by millionaire politicians. 
who represent the interests of bankers and corporations. I think, I think political decision-making should be made by ordinary people. But insofar as ordinary people organize themselves to try and make, make their voice heard, they face resistance because democracy is dangerous. Democracy is subversive. Democracy is threatening to those in power. And it's right to say, when they talk about the sacrifice, in inverted commas, of all of these soldiers, which is what the language used by politicians and revisionists, most of the soldiers who fought in the First World War had no choice. The vast majority of them were conscripts who were sent into uh, the inferno. And even those who were gulled into volunteering. And that's what it was. Included my granddad, by the way. My granddad was a volunteer. Fought at Luce, fought at the Somme, and was then in the Royal Flying Corps. Even those who were gulled by the propaganda into fighting um, a rich man's war, many of those people turned against it when they found out what it was actually like. The war was contested inside the war. Now, why is the war being contested inside the war? Because it's riddled with contradiction. And why is it riddled with contradiction? Because it is a war in the interests of one class in which most of the dying and most of the suffering is done by another class. So the question is not what should we, in inverted commas, have done in August 1914 if by we, the implication to the question is the British. I, would not, I wouldn't accept that as, as a category that, which, which I belong to. I would say this. If I was in Britain in August 1914, I would say that we, the European working class, the European labor movement, representing the interests of the ordinary people of Europe, we, in that sense, should have acted on what we had voted for again and again and again at our trade union conferences and our socialist party um, conferences in the run-up to war, which is that there should be coordinated European-wide strike action and demonstrations in the event that Europe's rulers went to war. And had that happened, had the German railway workers struck against the war at the end of July 1914, no German soldiers would have moved to the frontier. It was all dependent on rail traffic. So do you blame them for not striking? Is it their fault? It's the fault of their leaders. Of the, of, of the, tra of the leaders of the workers? The leaders of the socialist parties, the leaders of the trade unions, the leaders of the labor movement collectively right the way across Europe, virtually all of them, lined up behind their national governments and ripped up, in effect, all of those resolutions that had been passed. So, so those who then meekly went along with it and said, OK, we voted for this, we're ordinary members, but hey, we're just ordinary members, so we're not going to do anything about it, they're completely blameless. It's very, very difficult to organize a strike especially a national strike, even more an international, an international strike, if your leaders have abandoned you, because your leaders are the mechanism whereby you tie together large numbers of people. That's the problem. People are rendered powerless by this great betrayal. That's fine. Yep. So uh, do we have anyone with, with, with let's have a, a question or, or a comment. I mean, is anyone burning to, to ask, to respond? Yes, sir. Let's... When we see the royal family, in mourning at the Cenotaph each year on Remembrance Sunday, representing power and privilege as they do, does that not make them hypocrites of the highest order? Let's have a response then to that, Neil. Um, funnily enough, I'm not quite sure whether hypocrites is the right word. It's beautifully ironic. Um, because, of course, the reality is that all of those people who died in the First World War, or the vast majority of them, died in a war for the benefit of the people represented by the royal family. So there is a sense in which leading members of the British ruling class are paying homage 
to all of those ordinary working people whose lives were sacrificed in a war in the interests of people like themselves. Hypocrite may not be quite the right word for that, but it's certainly deeply ironic. Okay, sir. Dr. Fuller, I was surprised to hear you say that there was very, there was, there was limited suffrage for men just at the time of the First mm. World War. Certainly, I know it didn't exist for women, and yet there was universal suffrage in Germany, as I was given to understand that German, Imperial Germany, as it then was, was an autocracy. So surely you bring in the argument that democracies do not make war on democracies. We were a liberal democracy facing autocratic Imperial or the Kaiser's Germany. Mm. Mm. Can we try and give a, 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 a serious critique answer to that, please? as you have done to all the others. I mean, this is, the, you know... Well, I, I, I agree yeah. with what's been said. Oh, right. Can you just... Yeah. Um, yes, sorry, say a bit more. Sorry. No, no, I mean, I, I, I agree completely. I mean, one, one of... Both at the time and now, one of the things that was said was that Britain, were, Britain represented something that was democratic and better than Germany, which was dominated by Prussianism and autocracy and so on. And one general comment on this is that I think one of the things that's been happening over the last... I suppose since the centenary began is that, and this is, this is reflecting on the way in which revisionist history has shifted the argument over the last couple of decades, I suppose, is that many of the arguments that were put at the time to justify the war have been rehabilitated. So you will hear people arguing seriously. Serious, apparently serious historians will argue that, the, that Britain's liberal government went to war to defend poor little Belgium. And the argument is patently absurd. Britain's liberal government doesn't go to war to defend poor little Belgium. If it was worried about the rights of poor little countries, it could free Ireland, couldn't it? I mean, the argument is patently absurd. What they mean is that Britain goes to war because the invasion of Belgium is a threat to the balance of power in Europe, and that is a threat to British imperial interests because it creates the possibility of a hostile power in control of the, um, of the, of the channel. And of course, that's the, that's the, that becomes a reality in 1940. So we can see why Britain's rulers are worried about a situation where Germany comes to dominate the, the whole of the continent. These are the, arguments that were, these were, these are the arguments of war propaganda at the time. These are the arguments that were deployed by Britain's rulers at the time to persuade hundreds of thousands of young men to go to the recruiting stations to sign up for the war. And these same bogus arguments are now being rehabilitated as if that provides us with an historical explanation of what is really going on. No attempt to peel back the layers of propaganda and to understand the great power interests, the imperial interests that are in conflict with, this, with each other as this crisis unfolds. Question at the back here, gentleman in the blue. Um, I, I understand the concept of history being written by the victors, and, um, and I accept that to a large extent that that explains why um, perhaps some of the perspectives that uh, you've presented tonight perhaps aren't popularly understood. Um, but it strikes me that there are interest groups within Britain, the church. Um, being one of them, being in a, in a church this evening, who perhaps should have done more and could have done more over the years to represent the kind of um, very clearly anti-war perspective that you've presented tonight and to uh, present some of the arguments and would have reason to do so and yet seem to have miserably failed. Um, either have they been, I suppose my question is, have they simply been unsuccessful um, or is there another reason in your mind as to why um, some of what you've presented tonight has simply not been more uh, available in terms of uh, popular thought? From your perspective, Neil, your academic and your ideological perspective on that. You see, I, 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 th I think it's, ter you see, it's terribly difficult when they start banging the war drums. It's hard enough now. I mean, it was hard enough in 2001 when they sent the troops into um, Afghanistan. Um, it's hard enough now when they talk about ISIS 
and our television screens are filled with images of what ISIS is doing, and that is used to justify intensifying the military crisis in the region by bombing, by, 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 new, by new bombing The question campaign. was about the church. Yes, I know. Sorry, I know I'm coming on to it. Yep. No, I know. But you see, what, 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 what happens in those situations is that there's a tremendous power of propaganda and ideas behind, behind the idea of going to war. And it was much more so in 1914. Because 1914, society was much more deferential. I mean, it's, it's inconceivable that you could have had a war movement like the anti-war movement like the anti-war movement we've seen over the last 10 years before 1914. It's the experience of modern industrialized warfare, modern industrialized slaughter that creates that sense, that very widespread sense that people have that war is a, war is a, um, a terrible thing. So I think what happens is that all of these mainstream institutions capitulate before this wave um, of, of jingo. And it means that you need exceptional courage and determination, initially at least, to stand against it. And of course there are people in all of the churches who do stand against it, but they are a minority, except for those churches like the Quakers who have a kind of tradition um, of opposition to war. We are heartened by the fact that our founder set the example that most of us fail to follow. You, you hear me? I mean, Jesus, you know, as yes. our founder, yeah. yes, indeed. Indeed. provides an abiding uh, judgment on, on the rest of us. Neil, thank you. And I've written down here, and you're the academic and I'm the, the nothing, thesis and antithesis, or antithesis. This is Hegel and Marx have something to say about this, the idea that, 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 that arguments are put forward on one side and then counted on the other, and out of it comes... A synthesis, yes. A synthesis. Yes, yep. yes. Well, I suspect Hegelian. that yes. we've got to thank you for making certain that in this debate there has been not just a thesis but you know also an antithesis and we hope that out of this thanks to you and others like you we will reach a synthesis um, and it's another debate about whether you think there is any synthesis from the antithesis that you put but thank you for doing that standing against us in the tradition of the people whom you rightly hold up as champions against this this biggest agenda that's being pushed against you and for providing all of us with real food for thought so that we can have proper debates within ourselves and with our families and with our friends and with our churches and workplaces. So thank you very much indeed. And um, I'm going to say it and you can ignore it. I'm going to say God bless you in this because we really, really need the truth. And thank you for contributing to it. Thank you, Chris.